X, formerly known as Twitter, saying it will now allow political advertising on its platform. Elon Musk's social media site also planned to expand its safety and election team ahead of the 2024 presidential election. The move marks a big shift for the platform. Prior to Musk's acquisition of Twitter, the company had banned political advertising since 2019. Joining us for more is Teddy Schlieper, Puck founding partner. Teddy, great to see you. You're also the author of a new piece, Let Them Eat Vivek, which takes a closer look at the breakthrough candidate's donor hype in the wake of the first GOP debate. Teddy, as a fellow reporter on The Wealthy, it's great to see you. Um, sure. So behind this move in Twitter slash X ability and willingness to take political advertising, will it work? Will it chase away other advertisers that they're trying to, to bring back right now? You know, it really depends on the details here. I know that's sort of a cop out, but I am fascinated, I'll tell you, to see how Elon Musk enforces this policy. They've said that, you know, they are going to allow all political ads except those that undermine confidence in American elections. And that's a judgment call, as we all know. And what Elon Musk thinks undermines confidence in American elections might be very different than what you or I think, or what misinformation experts might think, or what other companies might think. So I am utterly fascinated to see how this meets uh, what the road here. I mean, is Elon Musk going to be censoring ads that, um, you know, talk about uh, you know, the, the tech companies going after Hunter Biden. Uh, that, these are hard decisions. And, and Elon and Linda Yaccarino especially are going to be in the hot seat. So uh, welcome to the Thunderdome, because every decision they make is going to be under a microscope. Well, Linda's going to be in the hot seat. Elon doesn't seem to feel any of this. I mean, it's interesting that that qualification, if it undermines faith in the American election system, is Trump back on the platform and is he active? Do you think he will be active on X? Well, look, I mean, the other day, you know, he did his first tweet in, in years, um, his first tweet since Elon Musk take, took over. I mean, there are contractual requirements um, with regards to Truth Social, but th sometimes I forget that he's allowed on Twitter these days. I'm sure, you know, people do, uh, other people do as well. Um, I'm amazed that he's been able to resist. I mean, he's been allowed now back ever since Elon took over. Yeah. And every day, you know, I, I have tweet notifications on for, for Trump. That's a, a vestige of an earlier era in my life. And, you know, just even seeing the Trump tweet come up, you make you, you wonder for a second, like, is this real? Is this a hoax? Yeah. Um, I think he'll tweet at some point between, you know, now and the Republican primary and then the Republican primary. I don't know how he can resist. Yeah, and I also wonder to what extent Twitter and social media is going to matter as much as the 2020 election, even the 2016 election. 2016, it was it seemed to be very powerful, obviously. 2020, maybe a little less so. What kind of impact do you think the political ads and just the political discourse will be on X as it relates to the election? Well, look, I mean, every candidate um, has tried to create their own, you know, earned media strategy. And oftentimes that involves owned media, right? You're seeing, you know, uh, with Vivek Ramaswamy, for instance, has his campaign, has its own podcast. Um, but the fact is that elite conversation, which matters, uh, still happens on Twitter. Um, it does not happen on Facebook. It does not happen on YouTube. Um, and the, the, the public square, as maligned and imperfect as it is, I think is still Twitter.com. And um, I do not think that there will be a mass migration by elites to other platforms. And if you're a campaign and you want to influence what reporters think, you go to Twitter. And that yeah. isn't, you know, influencing reporters is not the goal necessarily entirely of campaigns, but it is a huge part of political discourse. And I'm, I'm a buyer uh, on Twitter's relevance, maybe sadly, but I am. It yeah, and, and you've done some great work on looking at where the donations from big donors, billionaires, are going in Silicon Valley. I know Silicon Valley is not a monolithic place, lots of people giving to lots of different candidates. But are you seeing any patterns? I saw that Larry Ellison's giving a huge amount of money to Tim Scott. Nikki Haley yeah. seems very popular in the Valley. Is this more a bet about trying to have a connection to a potential Trump White House, maybe those candidates as VPs? Or what themes are you seeing with the big billionaire donors in Silicon Valley right now? And who are their favorites? Sure. I mean, Larry Ellison, uh, you mentioned, you know, we, we reported here at PAC has made an eight-figure contribution to Larry Ellison, to Tim Scott's Super PAC. Um, that should be public uh, later this year or early next year. 
Um, you know, Nikki Haley does have her supporters, but, uh, you know, the, the donor community made a pretty, not unanimous, but, but disproportionate bet on Ron DeSantis earlier this year. And that bet is backfiring spectacularly. Um, you know, I, the, the sense I get from donors across the country right now uh, as we approach Labor Day is just pure despondence. It's despair. It's a sense that does anything that they do even matter? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very simple point, but it's worth stating. Trump was elected, you know, or began his rise eight years ago in 2015. And I don't know that any Republican donors have sufficiently and convincingly figured out how to make a dent in his public approval. Like, I know that's an obvious point because he's president of the United States and he's the favorite this time. But the, the sense I get from donors who are smart people and capable in all yeah. their business pursuits is whether anything they do matters. So, like, yeah. I, I feel very nihilistic right now if I'm a major contributor about why not just go to the beach for the next six months and check back in on the general election of Trump yeah, versus Yeah, and it's Biden. also interesting, if, you know, to that point, big donors just don't have a great track record of picking winners. You know, to your point, 2016, they, they all rallied around Jeb Bush on one side, yeah. Hillary on the other. Well, that didn't work. If you look at Ken Griffin's backing of various candidates, um, that they, many of them haven't worked out so well, aside from DeSantis in Florida as governor. But, yeah, it, you know, does, does money even make much of a difference anymore, aside from the fact that they don't like any candidates? Sure. And yet I mean, they still raise a lot. Right. I mean, look at, uh, you know, we, we have a story at the puck about kind of the rise in donor circles of Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy. And, you know, this is a guy who is showing that just by being online and, you know, having a little bit of self funding he's put $15 million of his own money into the race, which is not nothing, but it's not, you know, it is not uh, Ron DeSantis-level money. Uh, if you're just online and present, it kind of obviates the need for having, you know, a couple sugar daddies behind you. Um, you know, you, are, you can be relevant but just by saying yes to every podcast appearance, uh, opportunity ever. Uh, and donors in that situation kind of follow the candidate rather than candidates following the donors. Um, and I think Vivek Ramaswamy is someone that major contributors are going to have to reckon with whether they want to or not.